All right, good morning, everybody. We are starting today with Srimad Bhagavata Mahapurana, book 12, um, book 12, discourse 6, verse 36, which is kind of the start of a new subject, mid-discourse. Mid um, so we have completed the Bhagavatam proper. Um, the narration of Shuka to Maharaja Parikshit. Um, and all that's left is a little bit more dialogue between Sutta and the Rishis assembled at Naimisharanya Forest, um, represented by their guru, Sholnaka. So Sholnaka submitted, into how many schools were the Vedas divided by Paila and other great souls, teachers of the Vedas and pupils of Veda Vyasa? Pray relate this to us. Sutta replied, from the cavity in the heart of Brahma the creator, who occupies the highest position in the universe, while his mind was composed through meditation, O Sholnaka, there arose a sound which can be distinctly perceived by all through control of the function of hearing and by focusing one's mind on which, O Brahmana sage, yogis shake off the impurities of the mind occasioned by the adhibhuta, adhyatma and adhidaiva, the, um, the body, the organs of action and the senses of perception and attain liberation, the cessation of birth and death. From that sound emanated the sacred syllable om consisting of three parts, a, uh, U, and M, mm, whose origin is unmanifest, which flashes by itself. It is this syllable which reveals the true nature of the almighty and infinite supreme spirit that hears this unmanifest sound, even when the sense of hearing has ceased to function, and whose cognition is intact even when all the senses are inoperative, as in samadhi by which sacred syllable speech in the form of the Vedas is manifested, and which owes its manifestation in the cavity of the heart to the Supreme Spirit. That syllable is directly expressive of its origin, the infinite Supreme Spirit. It is the hidden meaning of all mantras, the eternal seed of the Vedas, being no other than Brahman itself. The syllable Om, O jewel of the Bhrigus, comprised of three letter sounds, A, U, and M, mm, which hold in the form of a bija or seed, sets of three entities, the three gunas, the three names, Rik, Yajus, and Sama, the three um, spheres of substance, Bhu, Bhuva, and Svaha, and the three states of consciousness, wakefulness, dream, and sound sleep. Out of the aforesaid three aksharas, the almighty Brahma, the birthless creator, evolved the alphabet, comprising antastas, ushmas, svaras, sparshas, and the short, long, and prolated measures of sounds. With this alphabet, the mighty Brahma gave expression through his four mouths to the four Vedas, along with the three vyahratis, bhu, bhuva, and svaha, and om, with the intention of pointing out the duties of the four priests officiating at the yajna, the hota, the advaryu, the udgata, and the brahma. He then taught them to his mind-born sons, Marichi and others, who were all Brahmana sages and expert in reciting the Vedas with proper intonation. The latter in their turn proved to be the promulgators of righteousness and taught the Vedas to their sons, Kashyapa and others. Received from generation to generation in the course of the four yugas by the pupils of the various sages, pupils who observed the vow of Brahmacharya, the aforesaid Vedas were later on divided by Maharshis, into Sanghitas, Brahmanas, Aranyakas, Upanishads, and Upasanas at the end of the Dvapara Yuga, um, or literally what the way it said is in the period preceded by the Dvapara Yuga, so immediately after Dvapara Yuga is when the Vedas were divided into the Sanghitas, the Brahmanas, and so on. Perceiving the men to be short-lived, deficient in energy, and dull-witted due to the action of time in the form of Adharma prevailing, the Brahmana seers rearranged the Vedas as directed by the immortal Lord residing in their heart. Descended from the sage Parashara through Satyavati in the form of Veda Vyasa, 
as prayed to by Brahma, Shankara, and other guardians of the spheres for the vindication of righteousness, of Brahmana sage, in the current Manvantara too, the Almighty Lord, the life giver of the universe, divided the Veda, O highly blessed one, into four parts. Picking out and classifying in four distinct groups the multitude of mantras belonging to the categories of Rik, Atarva, Yajus, and Sama, even as various kinds of gems are assorted into so many groups. The said Maharshi compiled four Sanghitas, or collections, out of those mantras. Summoning in, into his presence four of his foremost pupils, Paila and others, the powerful Vyasa of mighty intellect imparted one of those collections to each, O Shonaka. He taught, they say, the very first Sanghita, under the name of Vafracha Sanghita, consisting of a collection of riks, to Paila, and the body of sacred texts in prose, recited during sacrifices and bearing the name of Nigada, which means prose, to another named Vaishampayana. Even so, he taught the body of samas or songs, going by the name of Chandoga Sanghita, to Jaimini. And the fourth, called Atarvangirasi, so called because it was cognized by um, two sages, Atarva and Angirasa, so hence Atarvangirasi, to his fourth pupil, Sumantu. The sage Paila taught his own Bafracha Sanghita in two parts, one each to his disciples, Indra Pramiti and Bashkala. The latter two divided his branch, Bashkala, divided his branch into four parts and taught one each, O Sayan of Prabhu, to his, to his disciples, Bodhya, Yagnyavalkya, Varashara, and Agnimitra. The reason they are dividing it more and more is because as the Kali Yuga progresses, the pupils are um, able to memorize less and less um, because their lives are shorter and their powers of intellect and mental, mental capacity are reduced. And so it has to be divided up more and more with less of it entrusted to one person. Indra Pramiti, a man of self-control, taught his collection to the learned sage Mandukeya, and his pupil was Devamitra, who in his turn imparted its knowledge to the sages Sobhari and others. Mandukeya's son was Shakalya, who for his part divided his collection into five branches and taught them to his, pu to his pupils, Vatsya, Mudgala, Shaliya, Gokhalya, and Shishira. The sage Jatukarnya, another, pu another pupil of Shakalya, imparted the knowledge of his own collection in three parts, as well as um, of its nirukta. So he added the um, nirukta, the, an explanation of obscure words, because again, as the Vedic knowledge is being lost as Kali Yuga advances, mo uh, even most Brahmana sages had by this time um, lost the ability to understand many of the words in the Vedas. Um, and so Jatukarnya added the Nirukta to explain a lot of words that had become obscure. And he taught this to his four pupils, Balaka, Paija, Vaitala, and Viraja. Bashkala's son, Bashkali, made out of all the aforesaid branches, the new collection bearing the name of Valya Kilya Sanghita. His pupils, Balayani, Bhajya, and Kasara, learned and memorized it. By these Brahmana sages were learned and preserved the Sanghitas forming part of Rig Veda. Hearing of the classification of these mantras of the Veda, one is completely absolved from all sins. As is well known, some pupils of Vaishampayana were known as the Charakadvaryus, because they went through, on behalf of their teacher, a course of penance to expiate the sin of Brahmanasaid, um, due to the fact that Vaishampayana uh, killed some Brahmins. Thereupon, Yagnyavalkya, another disciple of Vaisham, uh, Vaishampayana, submitted to his guru, Oh, of what account, venerable sir, will be the reward obtained through the penance of these pupils of yours of poor strength? I shall undergo a course of penance very difficult to practice. Offended when addressed thus, the guru retorted, get away, I have nothing more to do with you, a pupil condemning, uh, condemning brahmanas. Give up at once all that you have learned from me. Vomiting the portions of Yajurveda, which he had learned from his guru, 
Yagnivalkya, son of Devarata, immediately left the place. Sages beheld those portions of Yajurveda and greatly enamored of them, assumed the form of partridges and picked them up. Thenceforward, um, so the word for partridge in Sanskrit is pipiri. Um, that most attractive branch of Yajurveda came to be known by the name of Taittiriya, the um, Veda of the partridges. Seeking to obtain additional srutis not known even to his guru, Yagnyavalkya, O Brahmana sage, thereupon duly extolled the sun god, the master of the Vedas. Yagnyavalkya prayed, Hail to the almighty sun god, denoted by the sacred syllable Om, dwelling as the very soul of the universe in the heart of multitudes of created beings, falling under four categories, from Brahma down to a clump of grass, and outside, too, as the wheel of time revolving in the form of years made up of minute parts like an instant, a moment, and the twinkling of an eye, yet unlimited by any condition, like the sky, you maintain the progress of the world all alone by sucking and releasing the moisture. We duly and devoutly contemplate on that well-known orb of your venerable self, O jewel among the gods, which is burning there, O father, who burn away all the sins and miseries, as well as their seed, ignorance, of those who wait upon you with prayers, etc., in the manner prescribed by the Vedas thrice every day, at sunrise, noon, and sunset. As the inner controller of the multitudes of immobile and mobile creatures in this visible universe, which, as is well known, constitute your own bodies, you being their very self, you direct their mind, senses, and vital airs, which are all material. Seeing this world swallowed by the diabolical python bearing the name of darkness and wearing a most dreadful aspect and lying unconscious as though dead, you alone rouse it by your mere glance out of compassion, supremely compassionate as you are, and direct it thrice every day to the adoration of the Supreme Spirit, leading to the highest good under the name of their own sacred duty. Like a king, you go about instilling fear in the wicked, and waited upon at every point by the guardians of the quarters with offerings of water and lotus buds in their joined palms. Obviously, for the same reason, O Lord, do I resort to your lotus feet, bowed to by those adored in all the three worlds, desirous as I am of receiving knowledge of the portions of Yajurveda, hitherto unknown by anyone else. That is all. Sutta continued. Extolled thus, the celebrated and glorious sun god felt propitiated, and assuming the form of a horse, taught the sage such portions of the Yajurveda as were hitherto unknown to anyone else. Out of the con countless mantras of Yajurveda revealed to him by the sun god, the powerful Yajnivalkya compiled 15 shakas known by the name of Vajasini. The sages Kanva, Madhyandina, and others learnt them from him. Sage Sumantu, uh, this also is. Um, the origin of the distinction between the Krishna and Shukla Yajurvedas, the original Yajurveda um, of, compiled by Vyasa being called the Krishna Yajurveda, named after Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa. And the Yajurveda revealed by Surya to Yajnavalkya being the Shukla Yajurveda. Sage Sumantu was the son of Jaimini, the chanter of Samaveda, as taught to him by Veda Vyasa. And Sunvan was the son of Sumantu. Gemini taught one collection to each of them. Then Sukarma, another Brahmana pupil of Gemini, who had a mighty intellect, divided the tree of Samaveda into 1,000 collections of psalms. Hiranyanabha of Kosala and Paushyanji, the two pupils of Sukarma, and a third pu pupil named Av Avantya, the foremost of the knowers of Brahman, learnt them. Paushyanji and Avantya, as well as Hiranyanabha, had, it is said, 500 pupils who hailed from the north and learnt from them 500 shakas of Samaveda. Antiquarians call them prachyas. Um, this, some find this a little bit confusing because prachyas would normally mean people from the east. Um, but Sutta is saying they are from the north, 
Um, but Bratyas could also be interpreted in the sense of ancient people rather than people from the East. Logakshi, Mangali, Kulia, Kusida, and Kukshi, other pupils of Paoshyanji, learned 100 collections of the Samaveda each. Krita, another pupil of Hiranyanabha, taught 24 collections to his own pupils, while Avantya, a man of self-control, taught all the rest to his. Thus ends the sixth discourse entitled The Classification of the Vedas into uh, Many Shakas and Schools, and Book 12 of the Great and Glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. Discourse 7. Different schools of Atarva Veda and of the characteristics of the Puranas. Sutta began again. Sumantu, versed in Atarva Veda, taught his collection to his pupil, Kabandha. Um, technically, the Bhagavatam does not name his pupil Kabandha. That name is drawn from the Vishnu Purana, which specifies the name of Sumantu's pupil, who in his turn taught it in two parts to his pupils, Patya and Veda Darsha. Shauklayani, Brahmabali, Modosha, and Pipalayani were the pupils of Veda Darsha, who taught them his collection in four parts. Now hear the names of Patya's pupils, Kumada, Sunaka, and Jajali. Um, Jajali was a master of Atarva Veda, a Brahmana sage. These were the pupils of Patya, from whom they received his collection in three parts. Babru, a pupil of Sunaka, born in the line of Angira, and Sindhavayana, another pupil, studied two separate collections at the feet of their guru, while Savarnya and others were the pupils of Babru and Sindhavayana. Uh, Even so, there were others, Nakshatrakalpa and Shanti. Um, these were the authors of the Kalpas of these very names, the Nakshatrakalpa and the Shanti Kalpa, um, in which they wrote down rules for ritual acts. Again, they wrote down rules that had not formally, the sages had not formally felt the need to compose the rules officially because it was all being um, taught and practiced and learned orally. But as we're getting further and further into Kali Yuga, the ancient system started to break down and the ability to learn and memorize this, these vast amounts of technical information of the performance of yagnas were getting shaky. And so more and more, these sages were feeling the need to a meticulously record instructions for the rituals to make sure that they got preserved. Um, there were also Kashyapa and Angirasa. These were the teachers of Atarva Veda. Now here of the teachers of the Puranas, Oshonaka, having finished the great um, gurus of the Vedas who lived before Sutta's time. So we've only traced this down into still pretty early in Kali Yuga because the conversation between Sutta and Shonaka that we're hearing is also still pretty early in Kali Yuga. Um, so, and unlike um, Shuka who proceeds into the future with knowledge, Sutta does not do that. He's covering the gurus of the Vedas up to his time. Trayaruni, Kashyapa, Savarni, Akratavrana, Vaishampayana and Harita. These are a matter of fact are the six gurus of the Puranas. They learned one collection of Puranas each from the mouth of my father, Roma Harshana, the, pu the pupil of Veda Vyasa, while I, as the pupil of all six, studied all the collections. Kashyapa, Savarni, Parashurama's pupil, Aktravara, uh, Aktravrana, and myself, Ugrasrava Suti, learned four more original Purana collections from my father, Roma Harshana, pupil of Vyasa, that he did not teach to his original six pupils. Now here, O Brahmana sage, with a clear mind, the characteristics of the Puranas as determined by Brahman Rishis according to the viewpoint of the Vedas and Shastras. Those well-versed in the Puranas declare the Puranas as distinguished by 10 features um, in that um, to qualify as a Purana, a, a text is supposed to discuss at least the following 10 topics. Sarga, the creation of the universe. Visarga, Vritti, Raksha, the Manvantaras, 
Vanshas, the dynasties of kings, Vanshanu Charita, Samsta, Hetu, and Apasraya. Some teachers recognize the features of the Puranas as fivefold only, Osanaka, side by side with the distinction of great and small, um, as accordingly as they deal with 10 topics or five only. In other words, this making the distinction between Mahapuranas, which deal with all 10 subjects, and Upapuranas, which deal with only five of them. The evolution of Mahatattva, the principle of cosmic intelligence, through the disturbance in the equilibrium of the three gunas constituting the unmanifest primordial matter, of the threefold ahankara from the Mahatattva, and from the threefold ahankara of the five subtle elements, the eleven indriyas, the five senses of perception and the five organs of action and the mind, and their objects, the five gross elements, as well as the deities presiding over the senses, is called sarga, or creation. So we put on as opposed to go over all of that. Visarga is the name of this collective creation, both mobile and immobile, of the aforesaid causal principles fecundated by the supreme person, God, and brought about by the latencies of past karma of the countless jivas, proceeding from seed to seed as a continuum. Immobile creatures, such as plants, and um, in some cases the mobile too, constitute the vritti, the subsistence of mobile creatures. There again, the sustenance of human beings has been determined by their nature, by desire, or for some, even by scriptural ordinance. Um, thus, the description contained in Book 5 of Srimad Bhagavata of the terrestrial globe is the support of the entire creation, both mobile and immobile, thus falls under the category of vritti, and so it fulfills the requirements of a Mahapurana. The exploits of the avatars of Bhagavan Vishnu, the immortal Lord, appearing from age to age according to the needs of every age among birds and beasts, human beings, rishis, and gods, by whom the enemies of the Vedas, such as demons, are put an end to for the protection of the righteous, constitute what is known as the raksha, the protection of the universe. The period over which a Manu, the gods, the sons of the Manu, Indra, the ruler of the devas, the Septarishis and the partial manifestation of the Lord preside is what goes by the name of a Manvantara, characterized by these six elements. Vansha denotes the line extending over all the three divisions of time, the past, present, and future, of rajas of pure descent as sprung from Brahma and unbroken lineage. A connected account of such rajas as also of their descendants upholding the honor and prestige of the line is what has been referred to by the name of Vanshanu Charita, but you will recall this Purana did indeed go over at great length. The fourfold dissolution of this visible universe manifested by Maya, occasional, prakritika, constant, and radical, has been spoken of by the sage as samstha. The hetu, the cause of creation of this phenomenal universe, is the jiva, the individual soul, the doer of actions prompted by ignorance, which some people, who stress its spiritual nature characterize as having to its credit a stock of unrequited karma, while others, who emphasize its conditioned existence, declare it as nameless and formless. Apasraya stands for the absolute Brahman, which is present in all the three states undergone by Ajiva, wakefulness, dream, and deep slumber, as well as in all substances which are products of Maya, and is also distinct from them, which actually runs through all the states undergone by a living organism from entry into the womb in the form of seed to death. Um, being the ground or substratum of all such states of change, and is also distinct from them as their witness, even like the material of which substances are made, or as bare existence underlying names and forms. When the mind becomes still of its own accord, through realization of the illusoriness of sarga, as in the case of Vamadeva and other sages, or through concentration practiced in one's current life, as in the case of Mata Devahuti and others, then one realizes the self, consequent on the cessation of ignorance due to absence of distraction, and transcending the three states of consciousness withdraws from worldly activity. Sages well versed in the antiquities tell us of 18 Puranas, big and small, distinguished by the aforesaid characteristics. Um, in other words, meaning um, 18 which possess all of the characteristics that were just described. 
The 18 Puranas go by the names of Brahma Purana, Padma Purana, Vishnu Purana, Shiva Purana, Linga Purana, Garuda Purana, Narada Purana, Bhagavata Purana, which is the one that we have just read, Agni Purana, Skanda Purana, Bhavishya Purana, Brahma Vaivarta Purana, Markandeya Purana, Vamana Purana, Varaha Purana, Matsya Purana, Kurma Purana, and Brahmanda Purana. In this way has been duly narrated of Brahmana Sage the story as to how the sage Veda Vyasa and his pupils, their own pupils and pupils of their pupils, classified the Vedas into so many branches, a story which intensifies to a great extent the Brahmanical glory of those who listen to it. Thus ends the seventh discourse in book 12 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanhita. Discourse eight, the sage Markandeya embarks on a course of austerities and receives a boon. Shonaka said, O Sutta, O good one, may you live long. Tell us one thing, O jewel among speakers. You are able to show the way out to men wandering in endless darkness in the shape of mundane existence. People speak of Markandeya, the son of Mrakanda, as a seer blessed with a long life, who remained alive even at the time of Pralaya, marking the close of a day of Brahma, by which the whole of this visible universe was swallowed up. The said Markandeya, the foremost of the scions of Bhrugu, however, was born in this very Kalpa and in our own race. And so far as we know, no wholesale destruction of created beings has taken place during the present Kalpa from his birth to this day. It is further said that while drifting all alone in the single sheet of water with which the entire world was flooded, he beheld the Supreme Person lying as a matter of fact in the form of an uncommon baby on a leaf of a banyan tree formed in the shape of a cup. O Sutta, this is a matter of great doubt for us, due to which there is great curiosity in our mind. Pray resolve the aforesaid doubt, O great yogi, esteemed as you are for your knowledge of the Puranas. Sutta replied, this inquiry made by you, O great sage, is surely intended to dispel a misapprehension lurking in the mind of the people. Um, this, is, this is Sutta being polite, saying that Shonaka surely already knows the answer to the question. And he's saying, you are surely asking this for the benefit of others. Moreover, in replying to this, we'll have to be told the story of Sri Narayana, which when sung, washes off the impurities of the Kali Yuga. Having gone through at the hands of his father in due course, the sacred rite of investiture with the sacred thread, and studied the Vedas in the righteous way according to the scriptural ordinance, Markandeya was equipped in the course of time with asceticism and knowledge of the Veda. Observing the vow of Bala Brahmacharya, lifelong celibacy, and free from passions, he wore matted locks on his head and the sacred thread and a girdle of munja grass about his person, and otherwise used only bark for his clothing. He carried in his hands a staff, a handful of the sacred kusha grass, a kamandalu, a um, vessel made from the shell of a wild coconut used for carrying water, and the skin of a black buck, and a mala of rudraksha beads. For the enhancement of his virtue, he worshipped Sri Hari both morning and evening through the medium of the sacred fire, the sun, the guru, and other brahmanas, as well as by identifying himself with Sri Hari. Bringing food by way of alms morning and evening for the sake of his guru, he silently partook of it only when allowed by his guru, and at times remained without food if not so permitted, due to the sudden appearance of an unexpected guest to whom he would then give his own portion. Remaining devoted to austerities and study of the Vedas as aforesaid, and worshipping Sri Hari, the ruler of the senses of all, for a crore of years, that is, 10 million years, he conquered death, which is most difficult to conquer. Brahma, the creator, Lord Shiva, the source of the universe, Bhrugu, Daksha, and all the other sons of Brahma, men, gods, ancestors, and other created beings were much astonished at that extraordinary achievement of Markandeya. Observing thus the vow of Bala Brahmacharya and equipped with asceticism, study of the Vedas, and self-control, the yogi Markandeya contemplated on Lord Sri Hari, who is above sense perception, with a mind that had turned inward due to all hindrances in the shape of egotism, 
ignorance, likes and dislikes, and fear of death standing in its way, having been completely destroyed. Even as the said yogi was concentrating his mind through the great yoga of meditation on the Lord, a very long period covering six manvantaras elapsed. Coming to know of this and alarmed at the magnitude of his tapas, Indra, the Lord of Paradise, it is said, started interrupting it in this seventh manvantara for fear of losing his throne, or Shonaka. Uh, because at this point, Markandeya was becoming powerful enough that if he desired the throne of Indra, he could have easily usurped it. In order to bring about the sage's downfall, Indra sent to the sage Gandharvas and Apsaras, Kama, the deities presiding over the spring season and the south wind blowing from the Malaya mountain, as well as the um, deities presiding over greed and pride. They all repaired, O powerful sage, to the ashram of the sage along the northern slopes of the Himalayas, where flows the river Pushpabhadra and the rock named Chitra stands. The hallowed site of that ashram was adorned with sacred trees and creepers, crowded with families of holy Brahmana sages and studded with sacred pools full of pellucid water. The hermitage was full of the melodious humming of honey intoxicated bees and the notes of joyous or, or pollen intoxicated bees and the notes of joyous cuckoos. It was marked with the ecstasy of dance of blithesome peacocks and teemed with flocks of joyous birds. A breeze bearing the cool spray from waterfalls and embraced by fragrant flowers entered the hermitage and gently played on it, kindling love. There appeared the vernal season with its evenings made charming by the rising moon and with rows of young leaves and bunches of flowers and trees and creepers in close embrace. The god of love, followed by Gandharvas with bands of musicians expert in both vocal and instrumental music and leading troops of apsaras, was seen there with his bow and arrows in hand. The servants of Indra saw the sage comfortably seated with closed eyes near the sacred fire after pouring oblations into it and formidable like fire in human form himself. The damsels danced and the songsters sang, while other Gandharvas played charmingly on clay tom-toms, lutes, and small drums before him. Then Kama set the five-pointed arrow to his bow, while Spring, Greed, and other servants of Indra tried to agitate the sage's mind. Even as Punjikastali, the chief of the Apsaras, was sporting with a number of balls in front of the sage and running after them, her slender waist getting very unstable under the weight of her full breasts, wreaths of flowers dropping from her braid and eyes moving this way and that. The breeze blew away the fine garment about her loins, the waistband that held it fast having given way. Taking the sage as one by, him, uh, as one by himself, Kama darted his shaft at that very moment. But like the undertaking of an unlucky man, all his effort proved futile against the sage. Thus offending against the sage, but being scorched by his glory, O oh sage, they withdrew like children that would run away after having roused a snake. Though harassed, as aforesaid, by the servants of Indra, O Brahmana sage, the great sage Markandeya did not fall a prey to egotism. Since Indra's plan A was to try to seduce the sage and get him to wander off of his path, his plan B was to enrage the sage by perceiving this attempt and cause him to vent some of his built up spiritual power in throwing a curse at, at one of some of the Apsaras or Gandharvas or Kama in front of him. Neither happened. It is indeed no matter for wonder in the case of exalted souls. The glorious Indra, the Lord of Paradise was seized with great wonder to see Kama and his entourage cheerless and to hear from their lips of the glory of the Brahmana sage. To shower his grace on the sage who is thus concentrating his mind on the Lord through asceticism, study of the Vedas and self-control, Lord Sri Hari appeared before him in the form of the divine sages Nara and Narayana. Lords Nara and Narayana, the adored even of the chief of the gods, Brahma and others, were um, Nara was fair and Narayana was dark of complexion with eyes resembling fresh blown lotuses, possessed of four arms each, and Nara was clad in the skin of a black buck, while Narayana was clad in tree bark. They wore rings of the sacred kusha grass 
and the, and the sacred threefold thread, each consisting of three strands, as well as a string of lotus seeds, and carried a kamandalu, straight bamboo staff, and a broom made of yarns for sweeping the ground and clearing it of, of insects without killing them before stepping, as well as a handful of kusha grass. They were both tall of stature, and by the golden luster of their bodies resembling the bright flashings of lightning looked like two direct embodiments of tapas itself. Markandeya rose on seeing the sages Nara and Narayana, the two well-known manifestations of the Almighty Lord, and greeted them with great reverence by his body fallen flat like a log on the ground at their feet. With his body, senses, and mind exhilarated through joy occasioned by their darshan at close quarters, hair standing on end and eyes filled with tears, the sage could not look at them. With joined palms, he bent low, as though embracing them out of longing. He, he stood bent low, as though embracing them out of longing and said to the two almighty lords in faltering tones, hail, hail. Fetching them a seat and washing their feet, he worshiped them by offering them water to wash their hands with, sandal paste, incense, and garlands. When the two most exalted sages were comfortably seated and looked favorably disposed, the sage bowed at their feet once more and spoke as follows. Markandeya prayed, O Lord, how can I extol you? For propelled by you functioned the vital air, and following at the speech mind and indriyas, not only of embodied, of embodied beings, but even of Brahma, the birthless creator, and Lord Shiva, the god of destruction, as well as of myself. Yet you behave as a friend of the soul of those who worship you. These two forms of your omnipotent self, O Lord, stand revealed for the well-being, for putting a stop to the suffering, and for subduing the death of the three worlds. Just as you assume many other forms, such as that of the divine fish, in order, to, in order to protect this universe, so do you swallow everything after evolving it, uh, like the spider. The impurity is incident to actions. The gunas and time can never contaminate him who takes refuge in the soul's defeat of that savior of the world and ruler of the immobile as well as the mobile creation. In order to attain to those feet, as is well known, Sages that have treasured up the spirit of the Vedas in their heart extol, devoutly bow to, worship, and constantly meditate on them. I resort to those very souls of your feet. We know no safe retreat, O Lord, for the jiva beset with fear on all sides, other than resorting to the feet of the Lord in you, the embodiment of final moksha. Even Brahma, whose realm endures for two parādhas is immensely afraid of Kala, the time spirit, which is a mere play of your eyebrows. What wonder then that it inspires fear in the heart of living beings created by him. Therefore, turning my back upon this body and all that is connected with it, which obscures the self and serves no real purpose, is unsubstantial and transient, and no other than the self. I actually take refuge in the soul's defeat of the Supreme, in you, the embodiment of true wisdom, the director of the soul. For if a man resorts to those feet, he bids fair to secure from you every object sought for. Although Raja Sattva and Tamas, O Lord, which are products of Maya and responsible for the appearance, continuance, and dissolution of this universe, O Befriender of the Soul, have been laid hold of by yourself for carrying on your Leelas, your Sattvika form is conducive to everlasting peace and not the other two from which proceeds suffering, infatuation, and fear to men. Therefore, on realizing this truth, O Lord, Men of wisdom in this world worship your manifestation in the form of Lord Narayana, which is made up of sattva unmixed with rajas and tamas, and which is so dear to the heart of your devotees. For the followers of the Pancharatra school recognize sattva and no other guna to be the manifestation of the Supreme Person. And through sattva is attained the Lord's realm, as well as fearlessness and the bliss of self-realization. Hail to you, the aforesaid Lord, the inner controller, all pervading as well as existing in the form of the universe, the Jagad Guru, the, the preceptor of the universe, the supreme deity appearing in the forms of the immaculate sage Narayana and Nara, who have controlled your speech and promoted the cult of the Vedas. He whose judgment is clouded by your Maya and whose intellect is bewildered in following the paths of the misguiding senses does not, as is well known, cognize you, even though present in his own senses, vital heirs, even though you are present in his own senses, vital airs, and heart, as well as in the objects of the senses. 
the self-same man, though ignorant only at the beginning, directly cognizes you on obtaining an insight into the Veda revealed by you, the guru of all. I bow to the supreme person whose darshana that reveals the secret of the self can be obtained through the Veda and about whose true nature, sages, the foremost of whom is Brahma, the birthless creator, feel bewildered, though striving to realize it through Sankhya and yoga, etc., who presents himself in a character conforming to the conception of all the various schools of thought, and whose light in the form of the self is screened by the body and other limitations. Thus ends the eighth discourse in book 12 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. Discourse nine, the sage Markandeya witnesses the Lord's Maya. Sutta began again. Duly extolled in the aforesaid words by the talented sage Markandeya, Lord Narayana, accompanied by Nara, felt pleased and spoke to that jewel among the Bhrigus. The glorious Lord replied, hello, you have attained perfection, O jewel among the Brahmana seers, through concentration of mind, through unceasing devotion to me, as well as through asceticism, study of the Vedas, and self-control. We are highly pleased with you on account of your observing the vow of Bala Brahmacharya. May all be well with you. Receive your coveted boon from the ruler of all those who are capable of granting boons. The sage submitted, your exalted nature has been testified to by you, O ruler of Brahma, Shiva, and others, the adored of the gods, and that you have been directly perceived by us, O dispeller of the agony of those that have taken refuge in you. This much of favor shown by you is enough, O immortal Lord. Brahma, the unborn creator, and others have felt perfectly gratified, even on obtaining a vision of your glorious lotus-like feet only in their mind, purified through the practice of yoga. The self-same Lord in you has come within the range of my senses. What greater boon than this could I have? Nevertheless, O Lord, with eyes resembling the petals of a lotus, I would have a vision of your maya, under the influence of which the Lord, including the guardians of the spheres, perceives diversity in the form of this manifold creation in the one reality, O crest jewel of those enjoying sacred renown. Sutta continued, extolled in these words and worshipped by the sage according to his wishes, O Shonaka, the said Almighty Lord replied, so shall it be, and withdrew to Badrikashrama, smiling. Thinking every moment of the same object, the promised vision of the Lord's Maya, and continuing on in his own hermitage, Markandeya visualized Srihari in the sacred fire, in the sun, the moon, water, earth, the air, ether, and his own self and everywhere else, and worshipped him with articles conceived by the mind. In other words, not with physical offerings. He was doing manaso, uh, mental worship. At times, when overwhelmed with an outburst of emotion, he forgot worshipping the Lord. One day, at eventide, a jewel among the Bhrigus, while the sage was worshipping the Lord on the bank of the river Pushkabhadra, a Brahmana sage, a furious wind sprang up. Following close upon the blast that made a terrible noise, appeared frightful clouds attended with flashes of lightning and poured all round volleys of rain as thick as the axle of a chariot, loudly rumbling. Then there were seen the oceans in the four quarters with most terrible whirlpools, fearful crocodiles and a loud roar engulfing the earth on all sides with their waves tossed by the fury of the storm. The sage felt perturbed at heart and was dismayed to behold the fourfold creation along with himself tormented inside as well as outside by waves that rose to the skies, as well as by severe blasts and strokes of lightning, and the earth deluged with water. While he was thus looking on the boundless ocean that looked terrible with its waves and with its waters tossed about by a violent wind and was being flooded by the raining clouds, submerged the earth along with its dvipas and varshas and mountains, the whole universe comprising the earth and the aerial region and including heaven and the hosts of luminaries was deluged along with the four quarters. The great sage Markandeya, who was the only living being left alive, drifted along like a stupid and blind creature tossing about his matted locks. Oppressed with hunger and thirst, 
assailed by crocodiles and whales. So evidently he was not literally the only being left alive. Beaten by storm and waves, enveloped in endless darkness and overcome with exhaustion, the sage, while drifting along, could not make out the directions, nor the sky and earth. Now fallen into a great whirlpool, and now buffeted by waves, he was sometimes bitten by aquatic creatures, themselves killing one another. Now he fell a prey to grief, and now to infatuation. Now he experienced sorrow, and at other times joy. Now he fell a victim to fear, and now he suffered death, while at other times he was afflicted with diseases, and so on. Millions upon millions of years rolled away in the eyes of the sage, as he remained drifting along in that deluge, his judgment having been clouded by the enchanting potency of Lord Vishnu. Rolling about in that deluge, the said Brahmana once beheld on an elevation of earth a young and tender banyan tree adorned with leaves and fruits. On a branch of the tree located in the northeast, he saw a baby lying in a hollow leaf and swallowing up the darkness by its splendor. Markandeya, the foremost of the Brahmanas, was amazed to behold the baby, which possessed the dark green hue of a precious emerald, had a beautiful lotus-like countenance, a conch-shaped neck, a broad chest, a shapely nose, and charming eyebrows, and was graced with locks waving under the impact of its breasts. Its ears, shaped like the opening of a conch, were decked with the blossoms of pomegranate, its milk-like bright smiles were rendered rosy by the crimson luster of its coral-hued lips. The ends of its eyes were reddish, like the interior of a lotus. The ends meaning the um, outer corners. Its glances were enlivened with a smile that captivated one's heart. Its deep navel throbbed along with the folds of its belly, shaped like a leaf of the sacred fig tree that heaved with its breaths. The baby had placed its lotus-like foot into its mouth, lifting it up with its hands that had charming fingers and was sucking it, sucking its own foot. At the very sight of the baby, the fatigue of the sage altogether disappeared. The lotuses of his heart and eyes opened for very joy. The hair of his body stood on end and the sage headed towards the baby in order to make inquiries of it, though filled with awe at the sight of its wonderful form. Meanwhile, even like a mosquito, Markandeya, the scion of Bhrigu, entered into the body of the baby along with its breath. The baby just inhaled him. There, inside the belly of the baby, he saw the universe in its entirety, systematically arranged as before the deluge, and felt astonished and perplexed. He saw there the aerial region, heaven and earth, the hosts of luminaries, the mountains and seas, the broad divisions of the earth, including their subdivisions, the quarters, the gods and the demons, forests, countries and rivers, towns and mines, residences of peasants and farmers, stations of herdsmen, the four varnas and ashramas as well as their functions, the five gross elements as well as their products, time with the various yugas and kalpas conceived in it, whatever else makes worldly life possible, in short, the whole universe presented to him as though real. He saw the Himalaya mountain, the same river Pushpabhadra, his own hermitage on its bank, and sages dwelling there. Even while he was perceiving thus the whole universe, he was thrown out of the belly of the babe when it exhaled and fell back into the sea of deluge. Perceiving there the bunyan tree growing on an elevation of earth and the baby lying in a hollow leaf and gazed at by the baby with a sidelong glance accompanied by a smile full of the nectar of love, the sage, who was much too afflicted, proceeded to embrace the baby, who was no other than Lord Vishnu, and had already entered his heart through the door of the eyes and taken his seat there. That very moment, the baby, who was the almighty Lord himself, the master of yoga who dwells in the heart of all, suddenly disappeared, and the effort of the sage to hug the baby met the same fate as the undertaking of an unlucky person. Following the Lord, O Brahmana sage, the banyan tree, the deluge water, and the dissolution of the universe also disappeared in an instant from the sight of the sage, who found himself standing in his hermitage as before, before the vision of the storm began. Thus ends the ninth discourse entitled Markandeya Witnesses the Lord's Maya in Book 12 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. Discourse 10, 
Lord Shiva confers a boon on Markandeya. Sutta began again. Realizing in this way the aforesaid glory of Yoga Maya displayed by Lord Narayana, the sage Markandeya sought him alone for protection. Markandeya submitted, I have resorted to the soles of your feet, which grants security to those who seek them. O Hari, under the influence of whose Maya, which assumes the appearance of enlightenment, even the learned fall a prey to delusion in the shape of egotism, mistaking themselves to be wise. Sutta continued, while journeying through the skies on the back of his bull Nandi with his spouse, the goddess Uma, accompanied by his attendants, Lord Rudra, the god of destruction, saw the sage with his mind thus composed and collected. Perceiving the sage in that condition, Uma spoke to Lord Shiva, who has his abode on Mount Kailasa. Look at this Brahmana, O Lord, whose body, senses, and mind have been stilled, and who can be compared to a sea whose waters and fishes have become motionless due to a storm having passed. Manifest the fruit of his asceticism, since you are the bestower of fruit. The glorious Lord replied, in this case meaning Shiva, this Brahmana sage would not have any blessing under any circumstance, not even final moksha, inasmuch as he has attained supreme devotion to the immortal Lord, the indweller of all hearts. Even so, we shall discourse with the saint, O Bhavani, for it is the greatest gain to meet such a pious soul. Sutta went on, having thus observed to Parvati, the aforesaid Lord, the resort of the righteous, the master of all sciences, the ruler of all embodied souls, approached the sage. Markandeya, who had all his mental faculties suspended in the state of Samadhi at the time, was conscious neither of his own body nor of the outside world, and did not perceive even the advent of the very sovereigns of the universe, Shankara and Parvati, the inner controllers of all creation. Knowing his mental condition full well, the almighty Lord Shiva, the ruler of Kailasa, entered the cavity of his heart by virtue of his yoga maya, even as the air enters an opening. The sage felt amazed to perceive as having entered into his very being and flashed all of a sudden in his heart, Lord Shiva, a tall figure with three eyes and ten arms wearing matted locks, reddish brown like streaks of lightning and effulgent like the rising sun, wrapping a tiger skin for his loincloth and carrying in his hands a mala of rudraksha beads, a damaru drum, a begging bowl made of a human skull, a sword and a bow, a trident, a club shaped like the foot of a bedstead, and a shield. And wondering what the vision was and whence, he woke up from his yogic trance. Opening his eyes, Markandeya beheld Lord Rudra, the one guru of all the three worlds, arrived in his hermitage along with his divine spouse Uma and his entourage, and saluted him with his head bent low. He did worship to the Lord, along with Uma and the Lord's attendants, by according them a hearty welcome, offering seats, water to wash their feet and hands with, sandal paste and garlands, and burning incense and lights, and submitted as follows. What service can I do to you, O omnipresent Lord, who are sated with the realization of your own blissful nature, and because of whom the whole world feels satisfied? Hail to you, the all-propitious and all-tranquil Lord, the embodiment of sattva, and as such the delighter of all. Hail to you, who are never frightful through assuming rajas, and are never deluded, though assuming tamas. Sutta continued, highly pleased when extolled thus, the aforesaid Lord, the foremost of the gods in the resort of the righteous, heartily laughed, and with a cheerful mind replied to the sage. The glorious Lord Shiva said, ask of us a boon of your choice, since we three, Brahma, Vishnu, and myself, are masters of those who are capable of granting boons. Our darshana can never go in vain, it is through us that a mortal can attain immortality. Not only the guardians of the spheres, including the denizens of those spheres, but myself, the glorious Brahma, and the almighty Sri Hari himself, salute, worship, and wait upon Brahmanas, who are pious by nature, tranquil, free from envy, devoid of attachment, yet affectionate towards all created beings, are exclusively devoted to us, and free from animosity, and look upon all with an equal eye. They do not perceive the least difference between me, Lord Vishnu, and Brahma, the birthless creator nor between themselves and another living being. Therefore, we resort to you. Sacred places do not consist of holy waters, nor do lifeless idols alone represent the gods. The sacred waters and idols purify a man through a long process of time, whereas saints like you purify through mere sight. We bow to the Brahmanas who cherish our manifestation in the form of the three Vedas through concentration of the mind, reflection, study, and self-control. By merely hearing about you, 
for seeing people like you, even great sinners and the lowest born too get purified. What wonder then that pure people should get purified by conversing with you and so on. Sutta said, the sage did not feel sated while drinking in the words of Lord Shiva, who wears the crescent moon as an ornament on his head, which were full of the secret of dharma and the very abode of nectar to the ears. Having been made to revolve for long by the maya of Lord Vishnu and subjected to a severe trial, the sage was relieved of all his afflictions by the nectar-like words of Lord Shiva and spoke to him. The sage submitted, Oh, this leela of the Almighty Lord is diff difficult to conceive for embodied creatures like us, following which rulers of the universe bow to and glorify those who deserve to be commanded by them. In order to teach righteous conduct to the people at large, those teachers of embodied beings, as, gen as a general rule, not only practice such conduct themselves, but also express approbation of and applaud it when practiced by others. The glory of the Almighty Lord in you is not, however, marred by such exemplary conduct in the shape of those actions such as bowing to us, which are but the operation of your Maya, any more than the enchanting power of an enchanter by his conjuring tricks. Hail to that Almighty Lord in you, who having evolved the universe by his thought alone and then entered it in the form of the jiva, appears like a dreaming man as the doer through the three gunas, which are the real agents, and which, though appearing as endowed with the three gunas, is yet their controller, absolute in one without a second, and the guru of all in the form of the Veda. What greater boon shall I ask of you, O perfect one, than yourself, whose very darshana is blessed, through whose darshana man bids fair to get sated and become true of resolve? Nonetheless, I ask one boon of you, who are not only self-sufficient, but shower blessings on your devotees unfailing devotion to the Almighty Lord and those devoted to him, as well as to yourself. Sutta further said, Thus worshipped and glorified by the sage in sweet words, Lord Shiva, the destroyer of the universe, supported by his consort too, addressed him thus. Full of devotion as you are to Lord Vishnu, who is above sense perception, O great sage, let all this desire of yours be fulfilled. Let your fame endure to the end of the Kalpa, let religious merit and immunity from old age and death be enjoyed by you, and let knowledge relating to the past, present, and future, and self-realization coupled with dispassion, and the teachership of a Purana fall to your lot, invested as you are with Brahmanical glory. Sutta went on. Having thus granted these boons to Markandeya, the three-eyed Lord withdrew, telling his consort of the sage's deeds in the form of his austerities, as well as what had been experienced by him before. Having realized the glory of Maha Yoga, the Yoga of Jnana, Markandeya, the foremost of the scions of Bhrigu, goes about the world at will even now, exclusively devoted as he is to Sri Hari. This story of the wise Markandeya, as well as of the wonderful glory of the Lord's Maya as experienced by him, has been narrated to you. This glory of the Lord's Maya experienced by the sage Markandeya as extending over a period of seven kalpas, was, as a matter of fact, but accidental and a purely personal experience attributable to divine grace. Some, not knowing the appearance and disappearance of men, as, as the maya of the Supreme Spirit, declare this experience as taking place from time without beginning and repeated seven times at the end of every thousand revolutions of the four yugas during the lifetime of Markandeya himself. Both he who duly narrates to others and he who attentively hears, O jewel among the Bhrigus, this story of Markandeya, recounted as aforesaid and enriched with the glory of Lord Vishnu, who wields the wheel of time in the shape of the chakra in his hands, are rid of transmigration brought about by the latencies of karma. Thus ends the 10th discourse in Book 12 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Samhita. And I think we can end there for today. There will be only one more. Next week, we are going to finish. So thank you guys very much for coming. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Different. Wow. Yeah, we're pretty much. Do you have any questions, Mary? I have a couple questions. Go for it. 
I actually have to go. I have an appointment. All right. But I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Cheers. Dave, do you mind? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thanks so much. Uh, what was the, uh, oh yeah. It was in the beginning of the Mark and Dea story where they talked about the uh, first, second, and last foot of the Gaia tree being explained. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, that, that uh, yeah. relating what was being said to the feet of the Gayatri is not explicit in the Bhagavatam. That's something that some commentators have said. Um, I do see what they're talking about, though. Um, so the, the Gayatri mantra, in this case referring to the Savitri Gayatri mantra, um, this is the oh. famous, you know, Om Bhur Bhuva Svaha Tat Savitur Varenyam, etc. The, the famous Savitri Gayatri mantra. Um, Beautiful. So it's three. It's three feet. It's three padas. So, um, so the first of the three being Tatsavidur Varenyam, the second being Bhargo Devasya Dhimahi, and the third being Dhyoyo Nahprachodayat. Interesting. The meaning of those three lines in Sanskrit is um, bears a very close resemblance to that section of the discourse um, in, in such a way that some commentators on the Bhagavatam have interpreted that section of the discourse as essentially providing commentary on the three padas of the Savitri Gayatri. Cool. So that's what that was referencing. I'll have to read that again. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and let's see, uh, <clears throat> maybe one more question, if that's all right. Um, yeah, definitely. Thanks. Um, yeah, so many interesting points. Uh, Surya comes as a horse. Yes. And teaches, ya how do you say this, this uh, being's name? Yaj Yajna Valka? Yajna Valka, yeah. It looks like a Yagnya. yaj, doesn't it? Yagnya Valka. Right. It, 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 the, the, trans, the transliteration is weird because it is technically a conjunct of the aspirated j, but it is pronounced Yagnya Valka. Of course, I've seen that before. Yeah, yeah with yajas, you know, fire yajas. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's the same word, Yagnya, that's part of his name. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What does that uh, mean, Yagnya Valka? Yagnya Valka. Uh -huh. It slips my mind at the, off the top of my head. I would have to look up the exact yeah. meaning of Valka. But um, yeah, to, uh, so yeah, so yes, um, Lord Surya in the form of a horse came and taught the uh, what is called the Shukla Yajurveda to Yajnavalkya. Shukla Yaj, Yaj, what is it? So, so, so out of the three Veda or the four Vedas, the Rig Veda, Yajurveda, Sama Veda, and Atharva Veda. So we're talking about the Yajurveda, and there's two versions of the Yajurveda. There's the original one, um, which was when the Veda was divided into these four by a conference of rishis under the leadership of Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa. Um, hmm. That one, in retrospect, was named the Krishna Yajur Veda due to Krishna Dvaipayana Vyasa having organized it. And the new one, revealed by Lord Surya to Yajnivalkya, um, was called the Shukla Yajur Veda. Oh, wow. And cool. both of them survive, um, actually, none of the Vedas survive anywhere near in their entirety today. But parts of both the Krishna Yajurveda and Shukla Yajurveda still survive today. Um, different Brahmin lineages preserved each one. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, a thought just came to mind in the general story. What? happened to king parikshit he attained full moksha i mean the the naga takshaka the naga takshaka came and bit him um with such with such powerful venom supernaturally potent destructive venom that parikshit's body was instantly reduced to ashes oh yeah i'm remembering this as you say it yeah, yeah. but mere moments wow. before, but mere moments before that parikshit had attained full moksha 
um, he finished right. listening for seven days straight to Shuka. And then he went and sat down by the Ganga facing north on a mat of Kusha grass, composed his That's mind right. and fully freed himself and didn't even notice or care when the snake came and killed his body. He attained full moksha and merged with Vishnu in that moment. Ah, oh, so beautiful, nice. Yeah. Yeah, and so that was the end of the Bhagavata Purana proper. These last couple sessions we're having after that are just, my impression honestly is that the sage Shonaka didn't want Sutta to stop. And so it's kind of like asking him some questions at the end that, that got added on. Cool. Um, which is what we're having like now. like our post uh, post reading discussions every Sunday. Yeah, this we're, is kind of his post reading, reading discussion. Well, that's what we're reading <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Yeah. And oh, last question: Mark and Dea lived seven kalpas, but there's different interpretations. Is that the deal? There's different interpretations of the reality of his experience in the context of time as experienced by everyone else. Like it, we started off with the sage. Sonika saying, we've heard that Markandeya went through this experience at the Pralaya at the end of the world, but we know when he was born. There hasn't been a Pralaya since then. Like, how does this work? Uh, right. and, and so it was explained that Markandeya's experience was an answer to his boon asking to be granted a vision of the Lord's Maya. And so he experienced seven kalpas. But, wow. but the rest of the world did not experience those seven kalpas. He was kind of sure. in this vision out of time. And so that's why there's kind of different interpretations of how much time you want to say happened because time for him was different from time for everyone else. Wow. I, li I like that, though, that whole, like, <clears throat> that kind of the theory of, of that, the symbolism of that, of, you know, how we have time, like, through, for instance, transcendence you know, transcendental meditation, we have timelessness. Yes, we exactly. have access. Yeah, that he was Pretty able cool. to experience these millions of years passing, and then wakes up from it and like not and is at the very moment he left from still back at his ashram by Pushpa Padra. Yeah. But he really did in the ultimate reality of the universe that he did experience the Kalpas. He experienced fully. them, yes. That's so cool. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, really thank you very much. This. Yep. Hi, Bull. Hi, Bull.